we would like to welcome you to the launch event to, for the University of California Center for Climate Health and Equity. I am Sherry Weiser, and here with me is uh, Dr. Ariane Tehrani, and we are the founding co-directors of the center. Um, before we start, um, we just would like to take a moment to acknowledge the horrific acts of violence in Texas yesterday, um, following just after the incident of racial violence in Buffalo last week. So we're thinking of the victims, their family and friends, and, and all of those who have been touched by the violence. These intersecting crises of violence, inequity, the pandemic, and climate change require that we work together in communities to address the common root causes, and also require that we maintain hope and stay engaged in building solutions. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So the evidence is now unequivocal that the climate crisis is an unprecedented threat to human and planetary health. Climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying, with nearly half of the global population currently living in climate-stressed areas. And unfortunately, the window is fast closing where our actions can prevent the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. So at this historic all-hands-on-deck moment, we felt that it was critical to leverage the expertise and talent of the UC system, which is really a world leader in education, research, and innovation, to address the largest public health threat of the century. As a health professional myself, we took an oath to do no harm, but our lack of action is in fact harmful. So it is imperative that we work together to address structural injustices, including climate injustice, that undermine our ability to secure health and well being for all. The new University of California Center for Climate Health and Equity brings together faculty, staff, and students from all 10 campuses. Our goal is to advance equitable and just climate solutions that promote human health and a healthy planet. Our mission is to really harness the expertise and leadership of the health sector to drive ambitious climate action for health and health action for the climate. And we do this through four pillars of work, each of which, of course, are foundational to the university's mission. And these are research, education, health system, sustainability, and policy. And equity is a key thread throughout all of our work. We are a truly system-wide and statewide center. Our leadership team, which um, if Tiffany, if you don't mind showing the slide, um, which includes faculty co-chairs from each of our four pillars and faculty leads from each UC campus representing communities across the state of California. We are also launching thematic initiatives like our Climate and Mental Health Council that addresses the mental health challenges of the climate crisis. We are really grateful for our faculty pillar co-chairs and campus leads for their leadership and truly outstanding contributions, which have been really instrumental to getting the center started. The center is housed at the University of California, San Francisco and led by our small fantastic team and next slide um, that you see here. Um, over a hundred faculty affiliates from across the UC system lead education, research and solutions on all aspects of climate and health and span many disciplines from the health fields to earth and environmental sciences to social sciences and urban planning. We partner with the UC Office of Sustainability and UC Health, as well as other UC-wide efforts, including the Global Health Institute, the Global Climate Leadership Council, the Carbon Neutrality Initiative, the UC Center for Climate Justice, and the UC Disaster Resilience Network. We also collaborate with civil society and government partners in California and around the world. And I'll turn it over to you, Ariane. Thank you, Sherry. So as we launch, we are very excited to share some highlights of our inaugural activities in this coming year. In research, we are working to develop a California climate and health data repository, which will enable researchers and policymakers to access high impact data to inform decision making. Our faculty and students are leading a wide range of amazing research and uh, we are going to be funding community partnered research on climate change solutions in this coming year. So please keep your eyes um, out for that. 
Our educational offerings are expanding with a new UC-wide courses under development. Um, we have a launch of an education ambassadorship program to generate new climate health curricula across all health science programs in the UC system. In our partnership with the student-led Amazing Planetary Health Report Card Initiative, which is a metric-based tool for evaluating and improving planetary health content in health profession schools. This project um, has now reached over 80 medical schools globally and our UC students are funded this year to expand this work to additional health professions. Our sustainable healthcare work is growing through initiatives such as our green radiology program, which will look to decarbonize radiology practices um, and our work with anesthesiologists to reduce the use of environmentally harmful anesthetic gases. We're launching a decarbonization fellowship this year, which will support faculty members to lead decarbonization efforts within their departments. Um, and finally, um, we are hosting a regional policy workshop uh, with community partners and will work with local public health departments and community organizations um, in California on climate resilience and emergency response. Um, this includes an exciting plan initiative out of UCSF Fresno to train first responders and park medics on climate change and health. Um, the center would have not been possible without the moral and financial support of the UC Office of the President, the Carbon Neutrality Initiative, our UCSF Chancellor Sam Hoggood, and um, our UCSF Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Dan Lowenstein. And importantly, we'd like to recognize the amazing work and support of our faculty, students, and staff across the UC system, whose innovation, passion, and moral imperative compel the center into being. A special thank you to our students whose awareness advocacy have been a major inspiration and who have launched many exciting initiatives across the UCs to bring about much needed change. Now I'm gonna pass it to Naomi Baylor who will be our MC for our session today. Naomi is uh, currently serving as the center's managing director and previously launched and directed the Climate Change and Global Health Initiative at the UCSF Institute for Global Health Sciences. She has led research and advocacy efforts on climate and health nationally and globally, including on mental health, health systems resilience, climate and health finance, and the fossil fuel industry. Thank you, Naomi. Thanks, Ariane. Thanks, Sherry. And welcome again, everyone, to our launch event. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of this exciting new endeavor here at the University of California. So our event this morning is the first in a series of five events taking place as part of our launch. Um, this afternoon, our second event will be a panel discussion on the fossil fuel industry, and we will hear from investigative journalists, environmental justice advocates, lawyers, and researchers, about strategies for countering the health harms of industry and the way that industry is you know, shaping every, every part of our conversations about climate change. And then tomorrow we have a series of three conversations, the first on climate change and health education from the K-12 system through higher education, the second on mental health and climate change, and the third, a conversation with local, state, and national policymakers on how to advance healthy and equitable climate policies. So it is not too late to join these events. Um, please see our website in the chat box uh, for the links to register and we hope you can join us. Now, turning to this morning's program, we have a fantastic lineup. Um, we're going to open with welcoming remarks from University of California leadership and leaders from the environmental and cultural justice movements. We'll then hear from the center's directors, Sherry and Ariane, more about the history of the center, the vision and the impact um, that we hope to have. And that will be followed by a conversation with climate and health leaders to reflect on the state and future of the climate and health field. And then finally, we will be closing with remarks from both University of California and national leaders. Um, we have a packed agenda today, so we will unlikely be able to answer questions in real time, 
but the Q&A function on your Zoom is open, so feel free to drop any questions in the, in the question box and we will do our best to answer them as we go along. All right, so I would like to begin our event. Um, I'm honored to introduce Angela Mooney DRC, who will provide welcoming remarks. Angela was born in her ancestral homelands, whose traditional territories include the area now known as Orange County, and raised in the ancestral homelands of the Osage, Kaw, and Wichita peoples. She has worked with Native nations, Indigenous peoples, grassroots organizations, artists, educators, and institutions to advance environmental and cultural justice for over 20 years. She is the founder and executive director of Sacred Places Institute, an Indigenous-led environmental justice organization dedicated to building the capacity of Native nations and Indigenous peoples to protect sacred lands, waters, and cultures. So welcome, Angela, and thank you for opening our event this morning. Thank you. Mayuyan, I'm Angela Muni DRC. I am a Hashimim, and uh, yes, Orange County is my ancestral homeland. Um, thank you for this invitation to be here today. It's really crucial that um, you know universities and others get on board with not just land acknowledgement, but beyond land acknowledgement. I'm the executive director and founder of Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples. Our mission is to build the capacity of Native nations and Indigenous peoples to protect sacred land, water, and culture. And today I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders of all of these nations, both past and present, and respectfully acknowledge that the host schools of this meeting reside in the unceded traditional homelands of the Ahashaman, the Gabrielinho Tongva, the Chichenyo Ohlone, the Patwin, the Windhun Indians, the Yochidi Windhunisin, the Yokut, the Mono, Miwak, Uya, Luceno, Serrano, Payom Kuchum, Kumiai, and Amamasin. So just with those nations alone, um, there's a lot of engagement to be done in the nexus of health and climate and justice. And I'm going to read for you a land acknowledgement prepared by one of my colleagues at Sacred Places Institute, who's Tongva and a recent graduate of University of California, Irvine. To begin this land acknowledgement, I would like to share with you the significance of acknowledging those who are the traditional stewards of the lands we live on. Land acknowledgement is a practice to formally recognize and respect indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the territories you inhabit. Land acknowledgement is also the first step in educating oneself on building a deeper and more meaningful decolonized relationship with Native peoples and the land itself. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and a connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. Indigenous peoples in the United States live in relative invisibility. This invisibility is due to a multitude of factors including cultural and historic and ongoing erasure. Across the country, Natives are fighting for reparations, land return, recognition, and recognition of their sovereignty. But the American public continues to hear very little about this battle. The lands that we live on were not willingly given up by those who tended to it for centuries. Because of this, we must consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here today. We must take time out of our daily lives to recognize and remember that this land is still cultivated and cared for by indigenous people. Not only is it necessary to remember the people who reside on this land still exist, but also to recognize the land itself. We must take into account that nature that most of us have in regards to the land we live on. Most of us don't necessarily ask the land if we can reside on it. We don't ask for permission. We don't thank the water for flowing into our home or ask the plants and animals if we can use them for sustenance or medicine. However, Native Americans still practice asking the land for permission and being sure to give back to the land as much as we can. This idea of reciprocity is paramount in indigenous cultures and is what allows for Natives to live in peace with the land for centuries prior to colonization. Without reciprocity, we've seen many native plants, animals, 
people and other resources disappear before our very eyes. Knowing this, please continue to make an effort to learn about the land you live on and who lived on it before you and who continues to live there. By taking the time to learn from Native people, you can assist in, in ending this erasure and invisibility. And as a final word specific to this nexus between climate, health, equity, and indigenous peoples and homelands, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the importance of access of Native people to our ancestral homelands, including to the universities that are a part of this historic and critical endeavor. And I would also be remiss not to acknowledge the role that federal recognition has played and continues to play in the ongoing erasure and the lack of justice that California non-federally recognized tribes are receiving. The majority of the UCs in California are constructed on the unceded ancestral homeland of non-federally recognized tribes. And while I support and applaud the UC's recent announcement about waiver of tuition and fees for federally recognized Native Americans from California tribes or not, to have access to UCs, I must implore this Climate Health and Equity Center in your work moving forward to do better than the UCs have done so far about centering the non-federally recognized Native nations on whose lands we live and work. Because if we are to have any justice or equity in the realm of health and climate forward, then all of the Native nations who have been harmed and survive in resilience in spite of centuries of attempts to exterminate us is for naught. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Please continue to do the good work of building right relationships with the Native nations on whose lands you live and work. And please, as you move the center forward, remember to include non-federally recognized nations in that. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for joining us for opening our event and for sharing these important reflections on how we as a university and a center can best put equity and justice at the heart of everything that we do. Um, it is now my honor to turn to Dr. Michael V. Drake, the 21st president of the University of California. President Drake oversees the University of California's world-renowned system of 10 campuses, five medical centers, and three nationally affiliated labs. And we are honored to have your support and have you here as we launch our new center. So please join me in welcoming President Drake. Thank you very much and uh, good to be here this morning. My comments will be will be brief. Before I begin, I want to again acknowledge the horrific events that we all witnessed yesterday in, in, in Texas and, and say that, you know, many of us are, are parents, some of us grandparents, we're, we're all people. And events such as this really tear at our hearts. As I think of that, let me thank all of you for coming to work every day and doing the work that you do. You come to work every day to try to make the world uh, a better place. And I appreciate that consistent focused effort, even in these most troubling times, but thank you for that, that, consistent, that consistent work. And thank you for being here this morning. I'm, I'm actually quite delighted to be here to help launch the University of California Center for Climate, Health, and Equity. We're among the world's uh, uh, most prominent and successful public research universities, and we're fully committed to use that position to help our communities tackle the threat of climate change head on. There's no doubt that climate change is the foremost health crisis of our time. It's a crisis that is worsening existing health inequities in the U.S. And, and around the world. The most vulnerable among us bear the brunt of extreme heat events, deteriorating air quality, and other climate impacts. California is certainly not immune. As a physician myself, I'm deeply troubled by the devastating impacts of climate change and how they affect human health. Without coordinated interventions that focus on equity, climate change threatens to undermine decades of public health gains. That's just what this new center is all about. Together with other system-wide initiatives, such as the UC Center for Climate Justice, we are uniting the resources of one of the best university systems in the world to help California take meaningful action to protect our communities from climate change. And I'm grateful for all the work underway 
through UC Health and the UC Carbon Neutrality Initiative. We must continue leading by example and by reducing the impact that UC's own health centers and campuses have on climate change. That ongoing work has inspired and supported the formation of this center. To effectively address the challenges ahead, it's vital that we partner with others. We look forward to effective collaborations with leaders from different sectors across the state, from community organizers and state policymakers to ER doctors and student activists. The leadership of health professions is on this issue. The leadership of the health professions on this issue is, is essential. In times of political division and social upheaval, the public turns to trusted voices, and few voices are as trusted as those of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers. Those of us in the medical profession can help generate public and political will for climate action. At its core, that is the ambition of this center, to activate the expertise, leadership, and moral guidance of the health sector, and to drive the public conversation on climate change that we urgently need to protect health and, and health equity now and for future generations. The University of California has a central role in research and innovation to meet the challenges of climate change. We're also actively engaged in teaching and preparing the climate and health leaders of the future. With faculty leadership from all 10 of our campuses, and operational partnerships with our six academic health centers. The UC Center for Climate, Health and Equity is truly an integrated system-wide effort to foster climate solutions that protect health and advance health equity. This center is a prime example of why California continues to be a global leader on climate change. And I am proud to pledge the University of California's leadership and partnership with the state as we work together to provide a global model for addressing the health impacts of climate change. Congratulations to everyone involved in the formation and launch of the center. I know that together we can accomplish great things. Thank you. And thank you, President Drake, for your support and for your leadership. Um, it's tremendous to hear um, University of California stepping into this role. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Sam Hoggood. Dr. Hoggood is the Chancellor of the University of California, San Francisco, where he oversees the UCSF Enterprise, which includes the top public recipient of research funds from the National Institutes of Health, a nationally ranked medical center, and San Francisco's second largest employer of more than 30,000 faculty and staff. Dr. Hoggood has been at UCSF for 40 years with a career spanning all missions of the university. Welcome, Chancellor Hoggood. Hello everyone, I am Sam Hogan, Chancellor of UCSF. Thank you all for inviting me to speak today at the launch of the UC Center for Climate, Health and Equity. Health leaders agree that climate change is the greatest health threat facing the world in the 21st century. And this is our opportunity to not only act responsibly, but also to be a catalyst for change. Climate affects health and well-being at every stage of life, and climate change has a disproportionate impact on the vulnerable and marginalized among us, the very populations who contribute the least to the problem. The resulting health costs will be unprecedented, not only in terms of lives lost and widened disparities, but also for health systems that fail to prepare for these climate health threats. Now in California, we are already confronting deadly heat waves and historic wildfires that intensify by the year and threaten our physical and mental health. As health professionals, we are among society's most trusted leaders, making us ideal advocates for the health benefits of climate action. We each have a role to play in the fight against climate change, from helping to build community resilience, to preparing our hospitals and clinics for climate events, to advocating for climate policies that protect health and equity. As a pioneer in advancing health in California and worldwide, UCSF is committed to being a leader and core partner in our society's response to this public health crisis. We have both the honor and the responsibility to ensure the health of our communities 
and future generations. We must act ambitiously to confront growing climate threats and to address health inequities that are compounded by changing climate conditions. To this end, I thank Dr. Sherry Weiser and Ariane Tarani for their leadership that has led to this occasion and to the establishment of our new University of California Center on Climate Health and Equity. It is an honor that UCSF has been designated as the home for this important center, which will leverage the innovation, public leadership, and world-renowned platform of the University of California system to drive transformation change on climate and health. We see tremendous opportunities ahead as we join the growing movement to address one of the defining health issues of our time. And we embrace the significant responsibility to generate tangible actions to build climate resilient, healthy, and equitable communities in California and beyond. I very much look forward to the Center's crucial work in the years to come. And I thank you all for your commitment to addressing one of the greatest challenges of our time. Thank you, Chancellor Hawgood. So we're now going to hear from our founding co-directors, Ariane Tehrani and Sherry Weiser, about the origin and the vision for the UC Center and really hear what the center is all about. So before we hear from them, some quick introductions. Sherry Weiser is a professor of medicine and internist at the Division of HIV Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine at UCSF. She's a leading researcher on food insecurity, extreme weather events, and other social and structural drivers of HIV and chronic disease epidemics domestically and internationally. She is a member of the National Climate Security Roundtable commissioned by Congress and serves on the UC Global Climate Leadership Council. Ariane Tehrani is a professor of medicine and director of program evaluation and education continuous quality improvement for the UCSF School of Medicine. Ariane's research has informed local and global conversations and policies in educational equity and education for climate change and health. She helped found the UCSF Academic Senate Committee on Sustainability, where she served as chair. And she currently serves on the Global Climate Leadership Council faculty engagement team and co-chairs the UC Sustainability and Diversity Justice and Equity Advisory Committee. Dr. Tehrani was named by the University of California Faculty Climate Action Champion, an award given to one faculty member at each University of California campus in recognition of their contribution to the mission of sustainability and carbon neutrality. And our conversation this morning will be moderated by Sapna Thotathil, Associate Director of Sustainability in the University of California Office of the President. Sapna manages system-wide sustainability programs for the UC's 10 campuses and five health systems. She has worked on environmental policy for many years, sits on the boards of two environmental organizations, and is the author and editor of two books on sustainable food systems. So I will turn it over to you all. Thank you. Thanks for that intro, uh, Naomi. And uh, of course, I'm having some internet troubles this morning, so I'll turn my video off if needed. Um, but I'm excited uh, to be here today. Um, I met Ariane and Sherry a few years ago through their work with the University of California's Carbon Neutrality Initiative. And I remember being thrilled then to see our academic health programs taking on the issue of climate change and equity. And, and so here today, several years later, I'm excited to talk to Sherry and Ariane more about the new center and to learn more about them as individuals. So I'm going to turn it over to them um, and pepper them both with a series of questions. You are both professors of medicine at UCSF. Ariane, you're an education scientist, and Sherry, you're a doctor and an HIV and food insecurity researcher. What led or inspired each of you to work on the topic of climate change? Hi. 
Thanks, Sapna. You know, I, I come from a family of conservationists and teachers, so the environment has always been a part of my upbringing and education. You know, my career as an education researcher has focused on addressing the systems that create inequities in education and understanding the ways in which climate and health education can change practice for health professionals. Developing and studying solutions has always been a fundamental part of the work I do. So as someone working in education and equity, I realized I could not ignore one of the largest drivers of inequity worldwide. And I really wanted to play a role in developing those solutions. So what was the point in which you first brought climate and health together? Um, you know, my work at the intersection of climate and health um, began when I joined UCSF's Academic Senate Task Force on Sustainability in 2008. Um, the role of that group was to really look to examine how the campus could move toward a more sustainable vision. Over the years, you know, I joined and I led multiple initiatives linked to climate and sustainability, including teaching courses to students and faculty on climate and health education, developing curricula for the health profession schools, and designing education opportunities with local communities. Thanks, Arianne. And how about you, Sherry? Thanks, Safna. So I was actually seeing some very similar things in my own work. So issues that I had been working on for a very long time. So things like food and housing insecurity, poor mental health and chronic disease were in fact being deeply affected by climate change. And I'll give you an example from one of the studies that I was co-leading in the Nyanza region of Kenya. So our participants there talked about how the unprecedented drought and flooding in the region were really driving things like their food insecurity, their risk of getting infections like malaria and poor mental health. And extreme weather was also contributing to things that are you know, much less obviously linked with climate change, like their risk of acquiring HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, gender-based violence, and even their ability to take their medications on a daily basis when there was road or clinic closures due to flooding or other extreme weather. I hadn't realized how climate change could affect health in those ways, like impacting the risk of sexually transmitted infections. Thanks for sharing those examples. Well, thanks, Epin. Let me just continue for a minute. So it was those rippling and cascading effects of the climate crisis. So the fact that you know climate change can touch upon every aspect of our physical, mental, and social well-being that I think was the impetus for me to make climate and health a central you know, focus of my work. And it was also very clear to me that as a doctor, and we've been hearing a lot about this from you know, President Drake and Chancellor Hoggood, we can't effectively improve um, our patients' health or address disparities without incorporating climate change into clinical practices. So while Ariane and I were coming to these realizations um, ourselves and together, because we were working together at the time, we also noticed that our students were you know, really well ahead of the game. So they were already, advocating and maybe I'll say demanding for more content on climate and health at UCSF as they should have. Yeah, you know, without knowing each other, Sherry and I were paired up almost a decade ago to teach our faculty at UCSF best practices for teaching about climate change and health. And Sherry and I have taught a lot together since. And we came across many activated students who desired opportunities to engage in climate and health research, climate and health work. And so the students' needs combined with our own professional evolution is really where the origins of the new Center for Climate Health and Equity began. I agree. Students are inspiring. Thank you for listening to them. Um, and thank you for sharing this background and explaining in detail how you've seen the impacts of climate change in your work and research. And of course, you both are living and raising your families here in California, which is bringing you face to face with very stressful climate events on a regular basis in your personal lives as well. Ariane, I know you have had some experiences here. Yeah, so the 2019 Selmar fire um, in Los Angeles deeply affected my 13 year old who went on to, and she still does, you know, suffer sleepless nightmares and anxiety for weeks afterwards. And even right now, you know, she tends to have anxiety during fire season, heat wave announcements, and she's not alone, right? So there's a recent landmark study that shows that climate anxiety is prevalent among young people worldwide, with many reporting that their feelings about climate change um, interrupt their daily lives. 
As a parent of three children, this is deeply concerning and one that many parents will have to think about and actively address into the future. And youth really aren't the only ones that are disproportionately impacted. I really sympathize, Ariane. I think about this every day with my own three kids. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what this disproportionate impact looks like here in California? Yeah, so for example, in, you know, in Los Angeles, um, African Americans are twice as likely to die from heat waves compared to other residents. Agricultural workers are about 35 times more likely to die um, due to occupational heat exposure compared to other kinds of workers. We now know that redlined neighborhoods, so you know, those neighborhoods that are ineligible for loans and other housing programs are on average five degrees hotter than neighborhoods that are favored for investment. And because those housing and lending policies were rooted in systematic racism, these hotter neighborhoods continue to be largely communities of color. That is shocking. It's deeply troubling to hear about how climate change is impacting communities differently. And, and I'm just going to add a point here. So we, we know that people of color, low wealth communities, and people living in the global south, you know, are the ones that disproportionately impact the climate and health risks, even though they have contributed least to the problem. And I have seen this climate gap firsthand in the Bay Area. So I'm a health provider working at a safety net hospital um, where I treat many patients who are, you know, either underinsured or uninsured or unhoused. And I've seen again and again how few resources my patients have when they're dealing with these climate stressors. So whether it's lack of in indoor space to escape poor air quality or finding a cool neighborhood environment to help mitigate the impacts of you know, extreme heat, you know, and even um, you know, the ability to navigate power outages among those who have significant disabilities. Sherry, I remember waking up to red skies and ash raining, raining down from those poor air quality days, and those were the stressful times. Climate change does seem to be inescapable in California now. And globally, you know, we're, we're at a crossroads where our actions over the next few years will determine how devastating climate change will be for health and health equity. So how is the new center for climate health and equity rising to this pivotal moment and what is it trying to achieve? Okay, th thanks for that question. So as President Drake mentioned, our center seeks to leverage the expertise of the healthcare sector to drive ambitious climate action for health and also to promote human health and health equity. And this really starts first and foremost with uh, the health sector serving as a climate change steward rather than as a climate change contributor as, as uh, many health systems are now. So despite our guiding principle of first do no harm, we know that the health care sector's very large carbon footprint is contributing to global warming and is in fact harmful. So I think we first need to get our own house in order. And as, as uh, Chancellor Hallgood pointed out, so this includes everything traditionally within the healthcare domain like decarbonizing our health systems, you know, making sure that our doctors and nurses are ready to handle those climate and health impacts, and also strengthening climate resilience in our community clinics and in our public health infrastructure. So, um, Sherry, I apologize, I turned my video off for a moment, um, but are, you're talking about the health community working in the health sector. Yes. So, uh, yes. But I want to add that it's not only that, because I think that health gains are going to come when the healthcare sector can actually partner with and really help shape climate policies in other sectors. And just to give a specific example, a recent study found that if we eliminate air pollution from sectors like energy, transportation, and buildings, this could save more than 50,000 lives each year. So we can see that if we focus our attention as health professionals on affecting these policies in other sectors, this could be actually an incredibly effective way to improve and protect health. Um, but on the other hand, when climate policies don't explicitly consider health and equity, they can put local communities at greater risk and even deepen inequities. So for example, like urban greening and electric vehicles are certainly really good for the environment, but they're only gonna benefit equity if they're accessible to the most impacted communities. 
Yeah, you know, um, climate change is a major priority for California, and the state is investing heavily in this area, and these investments can bring enormous health equity benefits if they're done right, because technologies and solutions that limit global warming have health benefits, you know, improved air quality, positive emotional well-being, among others. Um, so really, you know, climate policy is health policy, yet a lot of the uh, climate action currently has occurred outside of this framing, despite the enormous repercussions to our health. And that's where the health sector and our center really can think creatively and partner strategically to drive change that results in healthy and flourishing communities on a healthy planet that is here for generations to come. We know that there is a tremendous history of environmental climate and health activism in California, and many communities and environmental justice organizations have been working for decades to achieve real progress. And as a center, you know, we really hope to be able to pursue partnerships with these state and community-based organizations that have been working on these issues for a very long time. I really like that framing that climate policy is health policy. So given the state's interest in climate change and UC's own mission of public service and its track record of innovation, it seems timely for our university to launch the center. Uh, you're right, <laughs> Sapna, we are thrilled to be able to harness the interdisciplinary power of the University of California, you know, with its leading and diverse researchers, clinicians, educators, and learners to address this, this health challenge. And when we think about how many learners we could reach, the role of our campuses in educating and training California's youth and workforce, it makes me really think about our potential for reshaping the way the next generation of learners uh, thinks about climate change as a health and health equity issue. You know, if you just think about our health profession schools, right? So UC's training over 15,000 nurses, physicians, public health professionals each year, preparing these learners to address the impact of climate change on health and really to recognize the ways in which healthcare contributes to climate change offers a really great opportunity to prepare them for their professional roles and also their roles as citizens in the wider society. Yeah, you know, I'm just gonna add a point here. So I think, um, you know, as Ariane has mentioned, uh, there's so many uh, strengths in the UC system and the UC health professional schools and hospitals, for instance, are among the top ranked in the nation. You know, the UC is actually the largest recipient of our, you know, national NIH funding uh, in research. And, you know, beyond health, our campuses have excellent schools of, you know, environmental sciences, geography, policy, and education, just to name a few. And these all have a critical role to play. And I would argue they actually need to be at the table in addressing climate and health. And another advantage is that the university spans the entire state of California, as we've been hearing this morning, which is on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, you know, as uh, we've heard from our leaders that the California is leading in this area by pioneering climate policy that can, you know, really serve as a model for building climate resilient societies worldwide. And I think in that context, UC's role as a state institution is one of the things that distinguishes us from many of the leading programs. So we have a public mission to serve our state and our state institutions on top of our research and teaching missions. So as President Drake said, UC is in that way a, nat a natural partner to help bolster the state's climate leadership. Sherry, can you build on this a bit more? You know, how do you propose to leverage these resources and this UC-wide nature of the center in its work? Well, innovations that we pioneer in one setting, you know, can quickly be diffused to other settings. And let me give you two examples from our work on healthcare decarbonization. So right now, faculty at UCSF have been working to reduce the use of anesthetic gases in the operating room, which as you know very well, Sapna, from your work, uh, makes up a big part of the hospital's carbon footprint. And it, very impressively, they were actually able to eliminate desflurane gas use completely and cut down nitrous oxide use significantly. And now this is being scaled system-wide. So another great example is our UC radiologists 
um, system-wide are looking into how to change radiology practices and clinical guidelines so that when we order imaging studies, we actually take energy use into consideration. And this will lead to major cost savings without compromising clinical care in any way. So I think the UC-wide nature of this work is helping us to avoid reinventing the wheel at each campus. And importantly, what we do at the UC can also inform many other health systems nationally and globally. And we also hope to leverage expertise across the UC system as we work to transform health professional education to incorporate climate change and sustainability, or as we really develop our clinical care protocols in um, our plans for responding to climate and health emergencies that we're hoping we will be able to do in collaboration with local public health departments and first responders. And to, Cal to Sherry's point of striving for best practices, um, you know, as an example, we are working on developing this data repository to be able to answer high yield policy relevant questions focusing on climate and health in California. Thank you both for um, explaining in more detail the system-wide nature of the center. I, I wanna now go back to this issue of equity. Uh, earlier, you both spoke about how equity has been a central driver of your work and that climate injustice helped drive your professional movement, both of your professional movements into the climate and health field. How are you both going to ensure that equity is a core part of the center? So, you know, we believe that that justice and equity are, are essential tenets of all climate and health work, whether it's education, clinical care, uh, mitigation or adaptation measures. This means more meaningful and equitable representation and participation from affected communities in all aspects of our work. It also means confronting climate change in an intersectional way, since communities aren't facing single issue challenges. The most successful approaches will holistically address the interconnected injustices um, that are that are presented and uh, most successful approaches want to be intentional at working at multiple levels. Um, so, you know, a, a prime example is, you know, there's a team of faculty and students that are working on developing um, patient care materials and climate sensitive care and readiness and um, they're doing so while engaging a diversity of patients in the point of care. To, to build off those great points, Ariane, I think the principles of equity need to shape not only the content of what we focus on, but actually how we approach this work. So as many of us have been talking about this year, we need to really be breaking down the typical power dynamics at play in these community academic partnerships um, and allow communities to lead the way in developing these solutions. So what does that mean in research? Well, that means equitable participation from affected communities in all stages of research. So from defining the problem to study design and implementation to results interpretation and dissemination. I couldn't agree more. Equitable participation is so important. Yeah, I mean, in fact, it's the goal of our center that community partners will be able to leverage the research expertise in the UC system to help them answer their highest priority research question and also that we can learn from communities' perspectives and expertise, which will help us all advance this field. And this is how I have at least tried to approach my work in, with food insecurity in the Bay Area, with uh, free meal uh, uh, food-based programs here. So our partners reached out to our team to help them generate the evidence on the health impacts of their program, and also on how to tailor the program to maximize health benefits. And then we co-developed all aspects of the research together. And I believe that working in this way will help ensure that our transition to a low carbon economy is gonna follow the healthiest and most equitable paths. Okay, so speaking of paths, when you look at the road ahead, what most excites you about the potential of the center for making an impact? How about we start with you, Sherry? Uh, sure, and th that's a good question. So I think the huge untapped role of the healthcare sector creates enormous potential for impact. So in fact, all of our gaps and oversights and our actions thus far, I think is what is one of the things that is creating major opportunities for change. I am also very excited, as I imagine many people are here today, on California's massive investment of $37 billion in climate change. And the UC can play an important role here. So what if all of that money was invested knowing what the health and equity impacts of those investments would be? 
Well, that could fundamentally reshape how we do climate policy to be truly cross-sectoral. And this will also have many health impacts for the most affected communities. Um, and similarly, what if all 300,000 students at UC, so from health professionals to future teachers to bench scientists, had foundational tra training in climate health and equity? Well, this could fundamentally reshape the trajectory of the state's workforce, including our healthcare workforce. And I think that also gives me a lot of hope. And then the last point I will just add is that with the COVID pandemic, we've seen both the pitfalls and the potential of the healthcare sector in driving massive social change. And so if we can take the lessons learned and leverage those strengths of the healthcare sector, but put it towards climate action, well, then there's a huge potential to help shape our future trajectory. You know, UC trains teachers and works with school districts and school leaders throughout the state. And there's a huge opportunity here for us to help ensure that all of California school age children receive a age appropriate education on climate change and health and are taught to turn that knowledge into action. And this could fundamentally reshape the trajectory of youth climate anxiety and the future of California's workforce and climate action. And um, actually uh, tomorrow we're gonna to be discussing both education and mental health in greater detail during our panel discussions. So speaking of climate anxiety, I've been reading the news about the heat waves in India and wildfires starting earlier and earlier each year in the West like this year, and these have been gnawing on my mind. Tackling climate change feels like a huge and overwhelming problem full of obstacles. What do you see as the major obstacles in climate progress and how might the center help push past these? So I think the key obstacles to climate progress are similar really to obstacles we see with other social problems. And these are politics and that includes industry involvement in politics, in this case, money, and very importantly, mis and disinformation. So of course, funding has always been one of the key obstacles, but on the positive side, the billions of dollars that I just talked about that California is investing in climate change, I think will make major headway in addressing important issues like wildfire resilience, drought management and extreme heat. But, you know, and the investment can have very big public health gains, but that's only gonna happen if health is a primary and intentional partner and focus to this work. So thinking a little bit more about the obstacles, funding and politics haven't always worked in favor of climate action. Um, what are other obstacles that you see? Well, you know, lack of institutional buy-in is another key obstacle. And unfortunately, Sapna, uh, the, CLUF, the health and climate link is just not high on the radar of many institutions, though we are thrilled that it is high on the radar of the UC system. So for example, several years ago in a cross UC survey that Ariane and I worked on with other cross UC partners, um, one of the key barriers that we found to implementing climate and health education was lack of institutional commitment at specific UCs. So for the grand health challenge of our time, we really do need to treat this with the urgency it deserves. And we also hope that the center could help address these major obstacles. So first, by engaging meaningfully in these policy dialogues. And second, by incorporating climate considerations into all aspects of clinical care, from how we train our health professionals to how we order our tests, to the supplies we use, and even to how we generate waste. Yeah, and the policy dialogues we have had to think about the ways in which we leverage training health professionals to be advocates for policy action and to actively address misinformation. This is particularly the case, given that health professionals are already facing the climate and health equity impacts on their patients and can speak to the urgency of the issue in a compelling and trustworthy way. Ariane, can you tell me a little bit more? How are you thinking the center can accomplish tackling misinformation around climate? You know, our plans to expand climate and health education to all sectors from K through 12 students, UC students and faculty to community health professionals will, I hope, play a role in combating some of that misinformation. I also want to, to note an opportunity here, right? So the University of California has a public mission and I quote, to serve society as the center of higher learning, providing long-term societal benefits. You know, we are ultimately anchor institutions leveraging our power, both the economic and the intellectual, 
to improve the health and social welfare of our communities. The work we do as a center has to be grounded in that mission. So for example, you know, addressing climate related health disparities in the community, training our workforce to serve climate vulnerable communities and serving our state to advocate for climate and health action. So Sherry mentioned earlier how the state has promised billions of dollars in investment on climate action. Combined with the recent federal commitments from the Biden administration, we're seeing record leadership on the inter intersection of climate and health. What is most exciting to you both about this growing field? And how about you first, Ariane? I am very excited about the investments in growth. As someone who has been doing this work for over a decade, the progress and uptick in action has at times seemed so incredibly slow, like it would never get done. And now it's here and I'm committed to seeing it grow to preserve our health and planet. Um, and I also see the movement strengthening among voices and groups that have traditionally been left out of meaningful roles and contributions. You know, what brings me hope is um, seeing women leaders like Colombia's Fatima Muriel advocating for women's health and well being during climate events. You know, seeing the power of a recent world gathering on women indigenous leaders holding institutions responsible for fueling the climate catastrophe. And very much watching the youth advocate for justice in the grassroots um, schools for climate action movement. Health impacts every human, every voice at the table counts. And it takes global and societal restructuring to bring about change. We need everyone advocating through an integrated and activated collective. I completely agree with Ariane. Um, so coalition building is just so essential. If we are gonna really do that work that Ariane's talking about to rebuild and reshape our societies. And you know, we have lived through historical moments like this before. So for example, with the HIV epidemic, and I think we're at a similar similar point right now, as Ariane alluded to, the energy that we're working towards capturing is one where we're all rowing together. So there's so much work to be done and we need to be collaborating to bring our contributions to bear on the problem. The way I think about it is that climate change highlights the many ways that our societies and economies do not work for us, particularly for our most vulnerable. So this can be a tipping point. We are actually being presented with a unique opportunity to fundamentally change how we live and work to create a more equitable, healthy, and sustainable planet. And so I'll just end by saying this is where I hope the movement will bring us and where our, we hope our center will make an impact. I like that, Sherry. We're rowing together. Uh, as UC works toward its carbon neutrality goals and continues to be a leader in tackling climate change, I'm excited to partner with the center. Thank you both, Ariane and Sherry, for telling us more about yourselves and for sharing your vision for the future of the center. I've really enjoyed talking with you both this morning. I'm gonna turn it back to Naomi now. Thank you. Thanks, Sapna, and thanks for that great conversation. Um, we're gonna pivot now and have the opportunity to hear from some of the leading voices who have been working on climate change and health for some of them for a long, long time. Um, so we, we know that getting to real action on climate and health will require everyone um, from all sectors. And the health sector is really diverse in the range of professional expertise that we have. Um, but too often we aren't working together across those um, different communities within, within the health sector. So today's panel brings together leaders who are drawing from a wide variety of perspectives, including public health, healthcare, environmental justice, and academia, to offer some reflections on the state and the future of the climate and health movement, and on the role of the university and this UC Center in supporting and growing that movement. Um, so joining us now to moderate the discussion is Dr. Lisa Patel, Deputy Executive Director of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health and Clinical Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford School of Medicine. Um, welcome, Lisa. 
Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited for this next panel. So we've heard some great insights from leaders at UC and their vision for the center. Now we're going to turn to a conversation from experts in climate health and equity to hear their advice for the new center. At a university system like this one, it's really important to consider various roles. The university serves a role in education, employs thousands of individuals, generates important research and innovation, and serves as a bridge, ensuring evidence is translated into policy. To be successful, the university needs to work with multiple stakeholders, such as community members, public health officials, students, healthcare workers, hospital administrators, and more. All of our speakers have a long history of accomplishments, and for the sake of time, we're going to put their bios into the chat, and I will do a very brief verbal introduction that does not do their bios full justice, but I just want to make sure we have enough time to hear from each of them. First is Gary Cohen. He is the co-founder and president of Healthcare Without Harm, an organization leading initiatives in over 70 countries to transform the healthcare sector to be environmentally sustainable and climate resilient. He's also the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship known as the Genius Grant. Jacqueline Patterson is the founder and direct executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project. This is a resource hub for Black, line, Black frontline climate justice leadership. Patterson previously served as a senior director for environmental and climate justice as the NAACP. Rohan Radhakrishna serves as the deputy director, chief equity officer, and tribal liaison for the California Department of Public Health. He was appointed by California Governor Gavin Newsom to lead the Office of Health Equity, including the Climate Change and Health Equity section, which works with local, state, and national partners to ensure climate change mitigation and adaptation activities. And finally is Marina Romanello, who is the Executive Director of the Lancet Countdown, a collaboration of 43 leading global academic institutions, producing evidence on the health dimensions of climate change and promoting a climate policy response that maximizes human health and well-being. Welcome to all of our panelists. We're excited to have you join us. So we're going to um, do sort of rapid round around each of our, our um, speakers here. I'm going to start, Rohan, first with you. So could you tell us a little bit about the mission behind the work that you undertake in climate and health? Where do you see opportunities for the larger health community participating in this mission to advance human health and equity and engage in effective climate action? Thank you, Lisa and UC for this invitation. The climate crisis is a public health crisis and is fundamentally about planetary health and people's health. Public health is central to addressing the climate crisis by addressing the root causes. We specialize in mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency. We've done it for decades with communicable diseases like COVID, with chronic diseases like COPD, and now with climate conditions a threat multiplier of disease and disability affecting every organ system and every community. Public health champions four pillars, and they are all essential to addressing the climate crisis. One, primary prevention. Two, the eco-social approach. Three, the intergenerational approach. And four, equity and anti-racism. First, let me formally define public health since it's still sadly during a pandemic deeply misunderstood. The Institute of Medicine defines public health as quote, what we as a society do to create the conditions in which people can be healthy, the conditions. So climate change is a health and equity issue rooted in the inequitable distribution of resources and power. Last September, we saw more than 200 medical journals publish an unprecedented joint statement warning that climate change is the greatest threat to global public health and urging world leaders to avoid catastrophic harm to human health that will be impossible to reverse. So fighting climate change is actually about preventing the worst health impacts associated as well as being resilient to a changing climate. Despite the mounting inequitable health impacts of climate change, addressing it represents a tremendous opportunity for win-wins to improve those conditions and the public health outcomes. We have solutions, no regret climate measures that bring the triple win, reducing emissions, reducing inequities, and increasing community health and resilience. Many examples exist from creating living wage, low carbon jobs, 
reducing driving and increasing physical activity through transit-oriented and infill development that maintains affordability and keeps pollution away from people, creating healthy local food systems, trees and greening, energy efficiency, weatherization, community power, and decision-making. All of these must be done through a health, racial, and economic equity lens, prioritizing investments in the communities most underinvested in. Here at the California Department of Public Health, at our Office of Health Equity, we've been doing this work for a decade. This year, we celebrate our 10th anniversary, and our Climate Change and Health Equity section has seven mighty staff. We maximize our reach by collaborating with other agencies to leverage the billions that have been mentioned of dollars in California's world-leading investments to address climate change by embedding health equity metrics, tools, and considerations so that climate programs address those upstream factors of housing, land use, transportation, to ultimately improve health and equity. One of many examples is our work with the California Air Resources Board. So California Climate Investment Guidelines guided all dollars funded through cap and trade revenues to explicitly improve health and equity outcomes. And we do this work with other agencies as well. We provide technical assistance and tools to state public health programs, local and tribal public health departments. And we also engage with community-based stakeholders to elevate their voice and increase their decision-making power. You know, President Drake and Chancellor Hoggood were correct. 68% of Americans trust health professionals for information on climate change, so we can be effective spokespeople. This is according to Eco America, and we bring that language of health to tables that don't traditionally have health representation. And that's because Eco America's research shows that now, for the first time, Americans' top reason for supporting climate solutions is no longer jobs. It's been surpassed. 76% cite health as the top reason. So in summary, climate change is a public health crisis. It's harming human health now. Public health has and will bring win-win solutions. Public health's four pillars, our frames and our tools should be centered and elevated. And we are more than thrilled to partner with the UC. Ron, I totally agree. Small but mighty office, and y'all are doing amazing work. So we're grateful for your work in the state. And this actually transitions perfectly, Gary, to the work of Healthcare Without Harm. Could you speak a little bit to how healthcare intersects with the public health response? Yeah, I mean, healthcare, um, as we've seen with COVID and also with the extreme weather events all around the country and around the world, healthcare sits at the epicenter of our collective trauma. It's the place that people go in through injuries of, of after, after disasters, um, it needs to be the last building standing in extreme weather events. It needs to be designed for, for the kind of uh, disruptive climate world that we are, we are growing into. And it's not only to be resilient in its own infrastructure and supply chains, but understand, as people have been talking about, the vulnerabilities in the community that, of course, replicate a lot of the health and racial inequities that we've lived with for generations. So being an anchor for resilience is a, is a key, key dimension of what healthcare needs to be in the 21st century. The second is, um, is decarbonizing and detoxifying its operations, its building, its supply chains. Uh, in the United States, uh, the healthcare sector is eight and a half percent of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's the annual equivalent emissions of where 100 coal fire power plants. So given that we take this Hippocratic oath to do no harm, as Sherry mentioned, we need to model an economy and a transition uh, where do no harm is the framework. And so how can we leverage, and the UC system has incredible opportunity to do this, how can we leverage our investments, our purchasing power, our clinical care, our uh, community partnerships, all toward a climate smart, equitable future. And then the third role, which Rohan just spoke about and, and others have spoken about is, is to leverage our voices. Um, because the narrative that has been operative for 30 years in the country, that uh, the climate crisis, A, isn't really so severe, it's going to kill the economy um, and jobs, that all that narrative that has been facilitated by the fossil fuel industry, um, it's a false narrative. 
And as people have said that many, many of the interventions we make around energy, around food systems, around green chemistry, around products, around transportation, they all have health benefits. And so healthcare professionals can be those messengers around that more integrated vision of what makes health happen and advocates for policy. And I agree with what everybody else has said is that energy policy is health policy, food policy is health policy, transportation policy is health policy. All these things, all moving toward a climate smart future will all improve the health of all Americans and everybody around the globe. The thing that I think that's so powerful hearing all of you speak is that there's this recognition that what healthcare needs to be in the 21st century is it needs to operate at three levels, the individual level, the community level, and the planetary level. And my hope, and I see that it's happening, is that the UC system can operate at all those levels and model that transformation for the rest of healthcare around the country and around the world. Great. Um, that transitions perfectly now to Jackie. You know, we've heard Rohan talk about creating the conditions um, for, for people to be able to thrive. Gary telling us about the role of healthcare systems in terms of being anchor institutions to promote resiliency. Jackie, what advice do you have um, for health professionals in terms of authentic and effective allyship with communities for this work? Thank you so much. Yeah, so first, uh, as health professionals, we have to fully immerse ourselves in understanding the extensive social determinants of health that differentially impact communities on the front lines of climate injustice, as was already said. We can't have optimal health in the context of climate change when indigenous communities do not have sovereignty, as cousin Angela said. We can't have optimal health in the context of climate change when we have such an epidemic of racial profiling and police brutality that families were shot by the police on the Danziger Bridge in New Orleans as they shot, sought safe safety post Katrina. We can't have optimal health in the context of climate change when historic redlining means that black communities are already more likely to be food insecure, which will only be exacerbated by shifts in agricultural yields due to climate change. And we cannot have optimal health in the context of climate change when we have missing and murdered indigenous women along the pipelines and along the man camps of oil and gas operations when we have spikes in violence against women in the aftermath of disasters. So these and so many more are the realities that we have to really confront and address in policy programming and practice to truly live up to the tenets of our profession as, as public health practitioners. To effectively design and implement public health programming, we have to ensure that we are following the Hamesh principles of democratic organizing, being inclusive, emphasizing bottom-up organizing, letting people speak for themselves, working together in solidarity and mutuality, building just relationships among ourselves and commitment to self-transformation. And when this happens, we see the magic that ensues. We see the Harvard School of Public Health supporting El Vejo, the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, and Pero and others in mounting the information and organizing needed to shut down the Fisk and Crawford coal-fired power plants on the south side of Chicago. We saw where the Clean Air Task Force partnered with the NA ACP to put out the report fumes across the fence line and used it to talk truth to power in Congress to push for the changes that we need in regulatory and legislative systems. We saw where the Physicians for Social Responsibility supported frontline communities in ending um, health harming nuclear and, and seeking to end health harming nuclear pro proliferation. And most recently, I've experienced first, firsthand as well a partnership with the Children's Environmental Health Network, where we're developing a paper and a call to action on just transition for the sake of the health and well being of Black children and all children. So these are the inspiring examples that illuminate how rooting ourselves in these principles and being in right relationship is really the key and in, to grounding ourselves and how to be, as you say, authentic and effective allies. So thank you. Jackie, thank you for all those really inspirational examples. And, and actually that, that turns perfectly to, to Marina. My, my question for you is hearing some of these examples for research, what advice do you have for researchers in the space of climate health and equity to be um, effective in terms of community partnership? Hey, Jan, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm really glad to see the center taking shape and coming to life. Um, I think that the research community has obviously done enormous amounts of work and has helped bring awareness of the health dimensions of climate change. But there's still a lot to be done in terms of properly understanding what are the cascading and rippling effects of climate change, because it does really, as we've heard already, undermine the, the very foundations that our good health depends on. 
And what is perhaps more important is that it interacts with the social and economic determinants of health to affect the most vulnerable communities the most and exacerbating and amplifying those inequities that really undermine progress in terms of health and, and uh, sustainable development simultaneously. So there's a lot of work still needed from the scientific community to really get a systems approach and a whole interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary understanding um, of, of what are the real implications of climate change to the health of the vulnerable communities and how to better address and better respond to maximize the health benefits of climate action. That said, however, we do have a lot of information and we do have a lot of knowledge. And I think that's something that's also conspiring for many of the, of, of the comments that we just heard and, and other comments from panelists. That is that despite all of our knowledge and despite all the awareness of the enormous threats of climate change to human health, there's still not much action happening and the action has not really been commensurate to the risks that we're facing. And that speaks a lot about the engagement of the scientific community with the policymakers, with the general public, and the way in which we can better put science at the service of climate action. So what is really crucial is that in developing research, in developing the science of climate change and health, we never lose that awareness of the fact that there's lives behind this and then there's vulnerable people that are really being affected by climate change. And it's those needs that we need to prioritize in designing our research, designing our projects and finding solutions in order to ensure that as we transition towards a healthy, low carbon economic system that is evidence-based with the right data to inform policymakers to make the right decisions and protect the most vulnerable populations. Thank you so much. And, and I think that's beautifully said is that we, we have a lot of information, um, but how do we also gear research around our solutions because we don't have much time left now to act. Um, we have our, you know, our UC leaders are here listening in terms of the launch of the center and here's an opportunity to provide some of your advice, given that the university has traditional roles in research education, career development, healthcare, workforce development, policy and advocacy. How should the center be working in these roles to advance climate health and equity? And how do you see the role of the university to push beyond these boundaries, understanding we need to move both quickly and thoughtfully on climate change? I'm going to start with you first, Gary. Yeah, so uh, it's exciting to hear all the opportunities. It's just amazing, truly. Uh, some research that would be really helpful is around, I would call clinical pathways of care that are climate smart. So uh, Sherry talked about uh, the work that had been done on anesthetic gases, nitrous oxide and desfluorine and, and radiology. There's a whole set of other opportunities that that the UC system could lead on in research and also the systems could model that transformation. Another example is ventilation. Um, if we change the an amount of air changes per hour, it's a massive savings in terms of, uh, of, of the footprint of, of, uh, of the healthcare system and it doesn't infect uh, patient care. There's so many different ways of when we, if we look at diabetes care and cancer care and treating asthma upstream by addressing people's uh, housing triggers. These, there's so many ways in which we can improve health and reduce our climate footprint. The greenest hospital that we build is the one that we don't build. It's the one we don't need because we're addressing upstream factors, as Jackie's talked about, that are making people sick in the first place and driving people to our emergency rooms. If we can do that work, then also we can have a po very positive climate impact. The other thing is, um, you know, there's enormous opportunity given the amount of purchasing power that the UC system has to model what uh, the a zero emissions healthcare system it is. So the UC system is part of a, of a network that we've created in the United States called the Healthcare um, Climate Council. It's, it's, uh, UC is one of 20 systems that represent over 600 hospitals, 10% so of the hospitals in the country, all trying to lead on these dimensions of climate change. So getting the UC system to model how that transformation happens where there's enormous opportunity for research and, and, and innovation, like we're all, we're all struggling with how do we heat our buildings without natural gas? What are the microgrids we can build in our community, not just for our own facilities, but for the communities that we serve and address energy poverty in our communities? So there's, there's such a wide array of, of innovation 
and transformation that's possible as we all travel down this path toward uh, zero emissions healthcare. Um, and I think there's also a way to link the purchasing power of the UC system with other healthcare systems, with school districts, with university purchasing to build healthy food systems in our communities that are more racially diverse, that are more proximate, that are more sustainable. Um, similarly with energy systems. So uh, I just think the sky's the limit in terms of if, we, if, if the leadership is there and it cascades throughout the, 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 the university and the medical centers, um, there's so many amazing things that we can do together, truly. So really bringing, getting our house in order and using that research and that opportunity to disseminate out across communities as well. It sounds like an amazing- Leveraging idea. all our assets. Yeah. Jackie, I'll turn the question to you, really, as we're thinking about pushing beyond the, the, these boundaries a little bit on, on what's possible, what advice would you have for the UC leaders? Yeah, thank you. I think when I was thinking of this question, I was thinking a little bit more of the how than the, than the what in terms of what this, so I'll just kind of frame it around that. So regarding research, recently I was at a workshop on, on co-production and I was asked about kind of a similar question about what I would say to research institutions around um, pushing boundaries. And I said that all of the institutions and universities and otherwise need to come together and develop principles of, of unity about how they operate, especially and then they need to turn those principles to the folks who are funding them <laughs> and, and say that we, we're standing together and saying that these, this is the only way that we're going to be able to operate. So too often we hear that certain behaviors or practices of research institutions are due to funder guidelines or mandates. So we can't have multivariate analysis because XXX, when we know that as Ariane indicated that in the words of Audre Lorde, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. Lives. The other thing we encountered is the urgency of unrealistic deadlines with the refrain of we have to do it along this timeline because again, funder mandates, but without taking the time to build relationships, the process and the outcomes will inevitably suffer because we don't have those trust-based relationships that you need in order to take leadership from frontline communities. So getting the funders to shift in some cases as a, as a matter of education. I've seen great transformations happen in the philanthropy and other when they just understand what's going on, they understand what's needed in order to have um, quality work that's actually transformational. For others, the more harder to move funders, it's a supply and demand issue because funders need to fund, but they need to spend those funds. So if research institutions stand united and say, we will only take your money united if we are able to have the time and latitude to develop trust-based relationships with frontline communities and making sure that those frontline communities are in the driver's seat, they'll have no choice but to adjust their, their edicts. And the other thing I'll just say secondly and somewhat relatedly is that, that we need to be holistic in our view of policy and advocacy from Medicaid reform and healthcare for all, yes, but as Gary said, change, we need to focus on our policy and advocacy on changing the conditions that disproportionately bring some communities into the system for treatment time and time and time again versus investing deeply in the well care and prevention. That means everything from health, health professionals testifying at EPA hearings on clean air and clean water regulations or public utility commissions proceedings on transitioning to clean energy to pushing for campaign finance reform as Sherry mentioned so that we have a regulatory legislative and judicial system that are acting at the behest of the people instead of the, the polluters so thank you. Jack, I love that the Stand United and I know there are a lot of medical students and residents listening who've often been at the, the forefront of these types of initiatives so I hope you all are listening to that idea as well. Uh, I'll turn it next to Rohan uh, for your answer on how do we push boundaries here. So being an alum from several UCs, I'm allowed to say in the same sentence, thank you for your immense contributions to climate science and leadership and you can and must do more faster. Do more faster. Be the boldest, most ambitious university system on the planet. Heed the United Nations Secretary General's Code Red for Humanity and what we as health professionals should be calling a Code Blue for Humanity. You employ and educate hundreds of thousands of workers and students each year. Your chancellor could be a chancellor for a nation. Your endowment and pensions rivals that of GDPs. Be the change. You have the opportunity and the guidance from the president now to go for it. 
First, the university can serve as an example how to quickly achieve carbon neutrality. Campuses are like small cities unto themselves with housing, land use, transportation, energy, water use, management, workforce, populations, including unhoused students. They are perfect laboratories and incubators for real life solutions. In a state as diverse and complex as California, our campuses mirror the unique demographic, geographic, and socioeconomic conditions in our state and world. And so we can really model that being local labs for this work and help inspire and partner cities and counties. We can apply and conduct applied community engaged science with people have already spoke about and form these collaborative power sharing partnerships to advance these goals and also be anchor institutions for anti-displacement and anti-racism. So modeling this work at the local level is one thing. Local jurisdictions across the state are grappling with the very same challenges between achieving ambitious emission reduction targets and confronting practical and financial challenges. It's a tragedy of the commons, but together with UC's model creative solutions, you can be a model for cities, counties, states, and nations. Second, the university should have all major decisions guided by a climate, health, and equity in all policies approach and be an example for state government. No research and no university action should be undertaken without considering the climate, health, and equity implications, direct and indirect. So you've heard of EIAs and HIAs, environmental and health impact assessments, but now we need CHIAs, climate health equity impact assessments, so we can internalize our externalities. You know, I used to be a UC grad student and I spent my time instead of studying anatomy, writing policy briefs for the regions to divest from Darfur and companies that supported the genocide. There's much more that the UC can do. The US military is the world's top organizational climate polluter. Are some of our research projects funded in the service of weapons and other systems that harm, kill and maim and create pollution? Beyond the movement for divesting from fossil fuels, we can end relationships with weapons and other military systems that pollute and harm human health. So let's get the carbon and the blood off our hands, out of our portfolios, our endowments, and our pensions. Third, we should focus our research and resources on what the data tells us matters, upstream and prevention. 70% of health status is determined by the upstream social behavioral drivers of health proportionally spend your resources there, not downstream. We only spend three cents on every healthcare dollar at the federal and state level on prevention. Don't repeat that mistake. So in this all hands on deck moment, we need to mobilize the full force of UC towards action and outcomes to show what's possible to institutions around the globe. Thanks, Rahan. So we've heard some great advice, Gary telling us to use the power, um, Jackie telling us to stand united, and Rohan telling us to be the change. And Marina, I'll let you um, be our, our last word on, on this question in terms of pushing boundaries. I think I have to echo much of what has already been said, but coming from the angle of researchers who care to produce data and who are embedded with the primary research and scientific side of things, I think there's a lot that uh, the University of California is really well positioned with the enormous resource that you have to really be able to provide those informed data and informed solutions that Roja was just mentioning. So really starting from the need, starting with the engagement with policymakers, ensuring that science is at the service of policymaking and really protecting the health of vulnerable populations requires the science to start from the need of, of guiding that policy change and really understanding how we can better design our scientific, our academic exercise, such that we can deliver the solutions that policymakers need to be able to do the transition to low carbon systems. Taking into account those vulnerable populations, taking into account the needs to reduce inequities and to really protect uh, the people that need it the most through solutions that have been informed by sound, robust assessments. Because we have very little margin of error. We're already far too late and we've already failed in preventing temperature of 1.1 degrees up until today. So from now onwards, whatever steps we take forward need to be really strong and really well based on evidence. And that's where the University of California with its broad 
um, diversity of expertise and the wonderful professionals that you have can play an essential role in helping inform that transition from a well-based scientific uh, angle. Thank you, Marina. We actually we have time for one more question, and this transitions perfectly to that last question, which is that climate experts widely agree that the window is closing to prevent the catastrophic outcomes outlined in the IPCC report. And while that window is open, I'd love to hear your reflections on, on the future, looking ahead, where is the field headed, and what is inspiring you and giving you hope in these times? And Marina, I'll start off with you this time, since you had to go last the last two times. <laughs> Oh, you're, I think you're muted. Oh. I think at this moment, what's giving us hope is that we are seeing a lot of engagement and a lot of change happening bottom up. So we're seeing communities becoming more and more aware and more and more engaged with the topic of climate change and health. And we're seeing the health professionals taking this to their clinics, taking this to their practices and really starting to engage with this issue. So what is for us an essential element moving forward is finding ways in which we can better leverage on that community action, ensuring that the transition happens across all of the sectors of society and that the people can actually support the, um, the systemic changes that we need to implement to ensure that health is protected in the face of climate change and that we will deliver robust change in our health systems. That requires still a lot of work. That requires being able to inform and to better communicate and to better engage with different key actors of societies from policy makers, from the general public, uh, medical practitioners, to be able to adopt the, the, the science, to adopt the information that we're providing and deliver that in a transition um, that, that just generates health protection. But we're seeing some changes, we're seeing a bit more engagement and we have seen enormous movements all through the world, including in the US, here in Europe, in low middle income countries, there has been an enormous amount of momentum building up to COP26, and now I'm really heading towards COP27. So we really need to leverage on that energy, on what the youth have been provided, on what the minority communities have been providing, and on the learnings of other communities that are at the, at the, um, at the front of climate change and really grappling with its impact to be able to deliver um, the solutions that we need. Thank you so much, Marina. I'll, I'll turn the, the question over to you now, Rohan. What, what is inspiring you and giving you hope during these times? Yeah, the, the president started by acknowledging the massacre in, in Texas, and it's been horrible, the number of mass shootings more than the number of days in this year. And we need to recall that two years ago, this week, George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. And that blatant exemplar of structural racism sparked a Black-led multiracial movement of 35 million people in the streets, more than one in 10 Americans during a pandemic, half of them protesting for the first time in their lives, demanding racial justice. That gives me hope because public health effects of the climate crisis are exacerbated by structural racism, which affects the distribution of health promoting resources. It is essential that we cannot achieve climate justice without racial justice, that we cannot achieve health justice without racial justice, and that we are moving in that direction. And to harness our institutions as anchor institutions for anti-racism is a tremendous opportunity to lead globally. Naming and addressing inequities based on structural racism will improve resiliency in health impacts in climate change for low-income and people of color and for all people moving towards a more equal society. So these people movements calling for deep structural change give me hope. The equity framework for resource distribution means prioritizing resources based on areas of disinvestment and sharing caste capacity and control for decision-making power. And I'm also inspired by systems aiming to reverse economic inequality that is dramatically increased in the United States along with greenhouse gases and emissions. So the conditions of economic inequality, they are causally linked to the health problems of life, lower life expectancy that was declining even before COVID. So to tackle all of these overlapping and intersecting wicked problems like racism, social inequality and climate crisis, we've heard about the need for coalitions. Health has to be at the table humbly, but leading with data, science, and truth in our voice. 
And I'm inspired by the power of the environmental justice movement and hope that we can build a climate and health equity justice movement, similarly to harness political power to create legislative wins. And finally, I have to say, I'm so inspired by students, both the young as well as the lifelong learners like some of us in the meeting today who grasp the urgency and the imperative to act. Let them push us. They are the stewards of the future and of the planet. And our mission, should we choose to accept it as the UC, is to boldly decarbonize, depolarize, and democratize to advance planetary and people's health. I'm motivated that we can do it and that UC will be a global leader in this. Thank you so much. Um, we'll turn it now to Gary. What, 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 um, what is inspiring you and giving you hope during these times? And what do you see in terms of the path ahead? Well, I'm, I'm inspired that the health sector is waking up to its responsibility to address the climate crisis. Uh, Healthcare with the Harm got together with the World Health Organization and the British government ahead of the COP26 in Glasgow and designed uh, the health program. And the health program asked countries to commit to decarbonize their healthcare systems and to make them more resilient in the face of the climate crisis. And 57 countries signed on to that health program, including the United States government. So the momentum to, to get the healthcare sector globally to transform itself, to address these new conditions, this new reality in the 21st century is, is unprecedented. And it's, it's about time, of course, given the urgency of the situation. And I, I'm also impressed that the, that the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States has prioritized climate, climate uh, change, health and equity with this new office as well as momentum and um, to uh, an executive order that commits all of our uh, federal facilities toward the alignment with the government's goals of reducing emissions by 50% by 2030 and 100% the latest by 2050. So there's, this is 20% of the US economy is, is the health sector. And so if we can move that huge part of the economy, we can have such a, a, a outsized influence on so many other sectors of our economy. So it makes me incredibly hopeful. And then I would, would also um, second a lot of what Rohan says. I think as we, as we bridge um, the climate movement full of young activists with, with movements around gender and racial equity, we are building the greatest movement the world has ever seen. And it's a movement for global survival. And it's a movement full of planetary healers of all stripes all over the world. So it's a gift to be among all of those people in that movement and to be alive at this time on the planet. Thanks, Gary, that's beautiful. And, and we'll turn it last over to, to Jackie for your thoughts to, to close us out here. Sure, thank you. Uh, I will just start a tiny bit grim for context and then end in the light of, uh, of hope. Um, so last year, I was on a panel with Stephen Benjamin, who was the mayor at the time of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And on that panel, he said that COVID-19 served as an x-ray to expose the broken bones of American society. Um, and I thought that was so, uh, yeah, just a, such a good illustration. And I talked about how on March 9th of 2020, when the lockdown hadn't started and COVID-19 was really largely being spoken of in the context of the outbreak at the Kirkland Hospital in Washington, but with a fear of what was to come. So I sat down that day for 19 hours straight and wrote this document called the 10 Equity Implications of the COVID-19 Pandemic. And it wasn't like a prophecy that was you know, brought down to me on these two tab stone tablets, but it was because the COVID's worst impact traveled down the well-worn pathways of inequity and injustice in our society from the pre-existing vulnerability to the power of the corporatocracy that needed our response and allowed COVID to run rampant. So all of this really points to the fact that whether it's COVID-19 or, or, or climate change or any of these other kind of injustices and inequities, the same kind of rot at the core is really what we need to address in order to, to get us to where we need to be. So all of this points to the fact that 
as a multi-sector whole, we have to collectively get on board with systems change, shifting away from an extractive economy that concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a few to a regenerative economy that ensures that we can all thrive. Contrary to the myth of scarcity, we have to embrace the reality of abundance. It's that scarcity myth that fuels the replacement theory, which spreads fear that there isn't enough to go around. So what we need to have um, as the public health community is as Sapna and Sherry said, is we all need to be rowing in the same direction. We, ha we can have jobs for everyone. We can have enough work to institute a universal jobs guarantee. So what gives me hope is that as we saw in the context of COVID, when hard times were more universal, we found the resources to have basically universal basic income. So the people had what they needed in order to live even as a, when they're in transition. We found the goodwill and the altruism to stand up an awesome mutual aid system, which started hundreds of food gardens and scores of microgrids and many so many other ways of, of caring for each other. We all modeled what's possible in developing a caring economy. So so if we have a system that's governed by the people, for the people, we can have a tax system, an economic system, an energy system, a food system, a transit system, an immigration system, and certainly a healthcare, a healthcare system that center care, that center science, and that center civil and human rights. And as we all see, that gender justice is racial justice, is climate justice, and we can do that together. So that's where I would end. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your insights. I feel very inspired after this. You know, we all need to be rowing together. There's an opportunity to bring all these movements together around justice, climate justice, is social justice, is racial justice. And we have the power of the UC system behind this greatest um, human health and justice crisis of our time. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn this back now to Naomi. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks everyone. That was fantastic. and. Ms. Patterson, you talked about moving from a mindset of scarcity to abundance, and Gary, you talked about the gift of being part of this community, and I know that everyone on our center feels incredibly thankful, and like it is a gift to have the guidance of all of you um, and, and building on the work that you've been doing. Um, so I'm going to turn it now to um, some final closing remarks from from two guests. And first, I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew St. Clair, who is the first Chief Sustainability Officer for the University of California Office of the President, and who has been leading sustainability efforts across the UC system um, for the past decade. So um, welcome, Mr. St. Clair. Thank you, Naomi. Um, and I loved listening to the, the panel that just spoke and agree uh, with everything that that you said, especially what UC should be doing and that UC should be doing more and faster um, on the climate crisis. So I can speak to how this new center fits into UC's broader efforts around climate change and sustainability that President Drake mentioned earlier. As part of UC's Carbon Neutrality Initiative, or CNI, all UC campuses, inclusive of their academic health centers, have committed to purchasing 100% clean electricity and to achieving net carbon neutrality for all of their buildings and vehicles by 2025. UC's academic health centers are also pioneering healthy, energy efficient lighting and all electric hospital design to take advantage of that 100% clean electricity. The CNI also advances UC's leadership in climate change research and education. This new center grew out of system wide collaborations fostered by CNI's climate education efforts in particular. Doctors Tehrani and Weiser organized workshops at UCSF as part of a CNI funded project on every UC campus to support faculty interested in integrating climate change and sustainability into courses across the curriculum. The CNI then funded a subsequent project proposed by Doctors Tehrani and Weiser to replicate their successful effort with faculty partners at each of the other five UC health systems. That project resulted in 99 new and revised courses, educating more than 7,000 students in sustainable healthcare. The collaborations built through that project form the core of the system-wide network of faculty involved in this new center. Given their track record, the CNI was excited to provide seed funding to this new center founded by Drs. Tehrani and Weiser. Mirroring the CNI, 
This new center will address overlapping areas where UC can make a difference, research, education, public policy, and modeling resilient carbon neutral campuses and healthcare facilities. The center's launch is timely not only because of the health inequities resulting from climate impacts in California, across the country, and globally, but also because UC's two priorities for the coming year on climate change are, one, developing plans to make all UC campuses and medical centers fossil free as soon as possible, and two, advancing UC's climate resilience leadership in research and education while also planning to make UC campuses and medical centers more climate resilient. Efforts around each priority will center equity and will lean on the work of this new center. This new center also aligns with California's and national goals around climate and health equity. For example, UC Health is signing on to the US Department of Health and Human Services pledge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase climate resilience. I look forward to hearing in a moment from Arsenio Mataka about HHS's climate and health equity work and how UC can partner to support those efforts. So I applaud the leadership from Ariane, Sherry, Naomi, Chancellor Hoggood, and the center's leads and partners at each UC campus for launching this timely essential center. UC's system-wide sustainability program and carbon neutrality initiative are excited to support the center and see it grow. Thank you. And thank you, Matt. Um, so it's it's now my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for the day, Arsenio Mataka, who is the Senior Advisor for Climate Change and Health Equity to the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health. Previously, Dr. Mataka advised California General Attorney General Javier Becerra on environmental policy and law. And prior to joining the California Department of Justice, served as a special advisor to California Governor Jerry Brown to help craft climate change legislation, and as Assistant Secretary for Environmental Justice and Tribal Affairs at the California Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so welcome and thank you for being here this morning. Well, I have to, I have to do one slight correction. I'm not a doctor, I'm a lawyer, um, but um, I'm happy to be here and really privileged um, to speak to you today. I wanna to start by saying um, that I'm thrilled to see and to hear from Matt actually about signing the pledge, but thrilled to see the UC system strengthen their leadership role on climate, health, and equity with the launch of this new center. I know the um, UC system has been at the forefront of this. I saw it firsthand in all my time in California. And so um, I just um, want to applaud you all for this first um, big, big step. Um, I want to say that, um, but I was listening, I listened to this whole entire panel. And to be honest, I could probably just trash my talking points at this point, because a lot of what was mentioned are, are some of the points that, that I wanted to say, but let me, <laughs> but let, but let me, um, let me, let me go through them anyways and say this is that, um, you know, as you, as you embark on this, this new endeavor, I would ask three things for you to consider um, as you, as you take on um, this new challenge. The first the first thing I would say is get get close to people. Get close to the people. And we've heard this from other people who are suffering today, today, right now, from the impacts of climate change. Focus on getting close to the people. We need to get close to the people that are catching hell from extreme heat, as was said earlier, drought, high energy prices, polluted air, living near um, living and living in housing that is ill-equipped to deal with all this stuff as we know. And we need to get close because we must remember that climate and, and health, climate health and equity cannot be decoupled. We know that wherever there is um, harm from climate change, it's going to hurt disadvantaged communities, vulnerable populations. We see it constantly. And like somebody else says, it's, it's not unlike what we witnessed in the pandemic. It holds true. And um, the communities that start at a disadvantage um, because of decades, as was said, discriminatory policies, decades of financial discrimination, um, damaging policing, um, lack of economic um, opportunity, lack of educational opportunity, uh, poor infrastructure. Those are the same groups um, that are always going to struggle with health challenges exacerbated by climate change. And so 
we must start our interventions and our work in these areas first with these folks um, if we're going to sort of um, realize the change. Um, I think we would be fooling ourselves if we think that we can make significant change with you know broad general solutions um you know that's not going to work we have to go out where the people are harmed the most and pilot solutions informed or even i would say created we talked a lot about co-creation but i would even say not co-creation created by the community experience from them first um second i would say and it's something that gary said um we need to change the story, Gary said, narrative. For too long, I'm gonna be just really frank. Um, when environmental policymakers talk about climate change, still today, health is but an afterthought. And I know that's not easy to hear, but it's it's my experience. I know that I've you know now I've been in California and DC in those rooms. And um, in those rooms, we don't talk about, you know farm worker who, who died irrigating the field in the heat. We don't talk about an elderly woman who, who died because she chose not to run her AC over a high electricity bill. We, we don't talk about the family displaced from their apartment due to excess mold from a flash flood. We don't talk about kids who live in um, the supply chain, what I call it supply chain death zone, due from ozone pollution. And we don't talk about parents um, who, have, who have to find a $30 fan and a $15 air filter to protect their families from wildfire smoke exposure. And we have a really hard time, a really hard time talking about mental health consequences and stress associated with all of this. And that has hampered us from a larger like climate policy standpoint. And that's all despite the fact that somebody mentioned that 200 medical journals shared its consensus statement in January that climate change is now the biggest global health issue facing the planet right now. And that's saying something in the midst of the pandemic. Um, despite, despite the fact that there will be significant increase, increase in ill health and premature deaths from climate sensitive diseases and conditions due to climate change, despite the fact that climate change is projected to significantly increase population exposure to heat waves, all these issues that we know that are facts, um, the narrative and the story still remains absent sort of health as a side issue. So the establishment of this center and others like it, I think will provide opportunities and space for conversations that, that, that need to be had. And I would say, um, you know, that's, I can touch on that a little bit later, but I also wanted to say the, the final thing um, in order to do to change the story, we need to act with intentionality. Okay, so what Gary mentioned we're doing at HHS is we're act. Well, the president was acting with intentionality. He directed HHS to establish this Office of Climate Change and Health Equity in a massive department, a massive department at HHS, because it was a, a desperate need, you know. And so I came to DC to hold up that and stand up that that office and. You know, the mission is, is, is very similar to what we discussed today, is to protect those living in the U.S. from the health threats presented by climate change, especially the, the most poor and vulnerable. And, um, and we're really, we're building a team that is solely dedicated, and I say that again, solely dedicated, because that's the purpose of intention, acting with intentionality. They're solely dedicated to pursuing three priority work areas. So the first is mobilizing HHS, that's inside our house, inside our box, to respond to the immediate needs of vulnerable populations facing catastrophic impacts of climate change. Um, the second, which is a little bit difficult, more difficult, as somebody mentioned, many mentioned, is treating environmental threats and climate change as social determinants of health, and really looking to go upstream and bolster, um, you know, um, the strength of disadvantaged communities as they deal with or or, or confront climate change. And the last is what uh, Matthew and um, Gary mentioned, is supporting healthcare providers to prepare for the challenges of climate change in three ways. It's building more resilient operations. Um, that was mentioned, you know, anticipating the impacts of climate change, both for catastrophic and chronic disease impacts for the most vulnerable populations so they can address this in, in managing their care. And to be just blunt, 
taking responsibility for their own contributions to climate change by reducing emissions. And I'm not just talking about CO2 here, and you know, there are some talk about anesthetics as well, but I'm talking also about all of the toxic air contaminants and criteria air pollution that spews. As Gary said, you have eight, eight and a half house sectors, eight and a half percent of the GHG emissions in the US. I told a, a, a panel that Gary was on that I view, I unfortunately view health systems as polluters. And I know that's not what you think of yourselves, but um, the emissions um, are wrecking havoc, not just on the world from a CO2 emission, but, but from those communities that we serve. And so a good and positive thing is what Gary mentioned is that the UC Health System, along with other um, members of the, the Healthcare um, Climate Council, they're leading the way. And collectively, they're showing the, you know, how we can make commitments to reduce emissions, and how we can be more ambitious. And a lot of the stuff that they're doing in there are more ambitious than the federal government's new goals on, um, on sort of um, decarbonization and reducing emissions. And so again, the establishment of the center is a one good act of acting with intentionality. The work ahead for you all must do the same. And I would encourage you to look inward and with that focus, for a lot of stuff that you all mentioned, we could do inside here within our own power, while at the same time meeting with, as I said, getting closer to the people who are affected. The policy thread of this is more difficult, and I think we need to continue to try to change the narrative. But I wouldn't. Um, I would. I would probably put more focus on what I could do within my own power as a health system, and what I can do with communities who are going to get hit hard and people who are going to get hit hard first. Um, and hopefully, you know, these environmental and climate policymakers come around to what the American people already know, is that they know their fear climate change because of the health impacts that they see that are upon them. And the environmental community will soon get that. It takes some time a while. But, um, and so I, I anticipate a future where, you know, we're leading the climate discussion with health and not um, ignoring it. So thank you. Thank you, Arsenio, for these remarks. As a longstanding advocate for climate action, it's such an honor to have you join us for our launch today. Um, we've heard from so many leaders this morning about the challenges and opportunities in front of us and their calls to action for the university. And we take these words of guidance to heart as we launch our new center. And we take seriously our commitment to work in collaboration with so many of you um, here today in our commitment to bringing the expertise, creativity, and resources of the UC um, to this foremost challenge. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sherry and Ariane to close us out for this session. Thank you, Naomi. So First of all, thank you to our wonderful speakers and panelists. We have heard your guidance that while we are a leader, we can and we must do better. So before we close, I wanted to thank the many people who have supported our center. First, a special thank you to Naomi Baylor for her excellent work as managing director of our center, her outstanding leadership on so many aspects of climate and health, and her tireless work envisioning and putting this event together. We also wanted to give a special thanks to Jennifer Monroe Zacharis, who has been our senior strategy and communications advisor and really a partner in crime over many years as we you know, brought this center to the point that it is now. We thank Tiffany Wade for her help with this launch, Carly Hampshire, our first center fellow, who contributed her ideas, passion, and activism to the center this last year. And last but not least, we wanted to thank our key advisors and collaborators who have supported Ariane and I since the beginning. So a very special thanks to Claire Brindis, a weekly advisor, jean V. Bonville, Juan Ha, Jeremy Alberga, Gail Lee, Catherine Gundling, Laura Schmidt, Tarek Benmaria, Richard Jackson, David Eisenman, Seema Gandhi, Lynn Stoller, and Alyssa Eppel, as well as our EVCP, Dan Lowenstein. They have each made so many valuable con contributions and the center will literally not be where it is today uh, without their ongoing advice and tremendous work in this field. Yeah. And echoing Sherry, thank you again to all of our speakers for speaking so compellingly on um, 
really where we're headed in this work. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this event this morning. We want to acknowledge with gratitude that we know you are here because this matters to you. Uh, we look forward to hopefully building collaborations with many of you post this event. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that this is the first of a series of events. Please join us um, tomorrow, this afternoon and tomorrow for a series of four panel discussions on the fossil fuel industry, climate change and health education, mental health impacts of climate change, and finally, as we hear from our local state and national policy makers about how to advance health equity in climate policy. You can register for each of these um, and join us for these events by visiting our website Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you this afternoon.